Hello and welcome to Weathersnap, the weather and climate headlines podcast from the UK's Met Office. It's Friday the 3rd of February. I'm Claire Nazir. And I'm Alex Deakin. This week we continue a theme that began last Friday, football and climate, and a very, very interesting initiative. And we go back 70 years to 1953 and remember the tragic events of the Great Flood. The water force was so huge that the western part of the Netherlands, even 50 kilometers inland, these communities were all devastated. First up, though, let's go back to earlier this week. Twitter lit up with some stunning images of the sky. Fantastic for cloud spotters. Nacreous clouds appeared in the skies over the UK, and particularly across parts of Scotland. These are sometimes known as mother of pearl clouds and are really quite rare. Yes, they are. They're beautiful sort of large disks which reflect vivid colours. And it comes from an old English word, nacre, which means mother of pearl. Now, these clouds are fairly rare. Um, I've only ever seen them once in the sky, but they're so magical when you do catch them. And this week on Twitter, there was some amazing imagery of these clouds. Lots of people spotted them. So where can they be found? Well, most clouds form in the tropopause. That's the weather making layer of the atmosphere um, where temperatures fall with height. So it's quite unusual to see a cloud in the stratosphere where temperatures slowly rise with height. So you don't have all the ingredients, and the mechanism for air rising and cooling and condensing, which is one of the sort of the main sort of processes of creating clouds. But they are there occasionally and it's only at certain times of the day and during the year that we see them, isn't it, Alex? Yeah, that's why they're so rare. Conditions have to be just right. They form in the lower stratosphere, so somewhere between about 15 and 25 kilometres up in the sky. And as you say, you don't have the normal mechanisms for forming clouds. And they have to be just right. You have to illuminate them from below. So they, they glow from the sun when the sun is actually below the horizon. So we have to be after sunset or, or just before sunrise. Temperatures have to be below minus 78 degrees Celsius for these clouds to form as well. Now, it's obviously pretty cold in the stratosphere anyway, but you're only going to get those kind of temperatures in the winter months. And it's actually all tied in with the polar vortex when the really cold air is far enough south uh, that we're going to be able to see them across the UK. They're much more common in higher latitudes, places like Scandinavia and northern Canada. So is it just little tiny crystals in the sky which mm. um, sort of reflect that light in such a beautiful way? Yeah, there has to be ice crystals. And the thing about the ice crystals is they're smaller than the normal ice crystals that you get in the troposphere forming forming a classic normal clouds that appear white. The the ice crystals are smaller uh, and so they reflect the light in different ways. They're also made up of, of acid, sulfuric and, and nitric acid floating around in there as well. And that all contributes to those vivid colours. They look a bit like, if you haven't seen them, you know, go search them up on, on, on Twitter. We posted some earlier or indeed on our TikTok account. Um, but yeah, they look like that sheen you get when you put oil on a thin layer of oil on water. Don't you? It's that that luminescence look absolutely stunning. I've never seen them. I'm very jealous that you've seen them. Claire. Yeah, I saw them on a train going to Cambridgeshire. I was doing my advanced forecasting course in Reading and I was heading to Cambridgeshire for the weekend. And I remember looking at the horizon as the sun was setting, thinking, oh, my goodness, this is utterly amazing. And obviously, you know, uh, the key thing about learning weather, you do start with the basics, which is identifying cloud types. Some clouds don't indicate any type of weather at all. Certainly with nacreous, really, it's not anything that's going to really impact us directly. But other clouds do indicate or warn of stormy weather. And in fact, on the 31st of January 1953, the storm clouds were brewing and delivered dire consequences this storm, with a storm surge of 5.6 metres higher than sea level, swept across the North Sea and devastated coastal communities in the UK and continental Europe. In Britain, 307 people died as a result of the flooding, while a further 207 lives were lost at sea as fishing boats and ferries capsized. Yeah, a really severe storm this. And it, it was all about the track, wasn't it? It just went 
almost due south down the North Sea and that combination of low pressure, really strong winds, high tide. It was just a recipe for everything to go wrong. And of course, that storm surge, the low pressure itself just meant that the that 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 raised the sea level and it all pushed down. And the geography of the North Sea just meant that that swell just kept on growing and eventually, you know, pushed everything even further south and across the Netherlands as the water just pushed south and overwhelmed the low lying regions there. So together with casualties in the UK and Belgium, the Netherlands experienced the greatest impacts with 1,836 people losing their lives. Professor Albert Kleintank is director of the Hadley Centre for Climate Science and Services based at the Met Office. Here he describes the lasting legacy the 1953 event has had on the Netherlands. A former colleague, um, really uh, his family suffered from the 1953 floods. He told the story that the people were really surprised. The water came so quick, they didn't have time to get away and to evacuate their home. What they usually did, and he did the same with his family. He was at that time, he was I think 12 or 13 years old. Together with his mom and dad, they moved upstairs. But then the water was at a higher level, so they had to go to the ceiling. And at that time, they were really stuck at the ceiling. For some families, everything was okay, but the water force was so huge that it really pushed away a lot of the houses in the low area in the west of the Netherlands. And that was really for his home also. It didn't withstand the water, so he had to be rescued by somebody passing by. And that was really a coincidence. A few family members were rescued, the others all passed away. So in that incident, he lost his dad and one of his brothers. In the Netherlands, these stories are now told more often than in the past, because at the time, in 1953, it was only eight years after the Second World War. So people wanted to get on and they wanted to rebuild infrastructure and houses. And this extreme event was really adding to the effort and the challenge they had. So I think the first 10 or 20 years, the stories were not really told. It was much later on. These stories are very much having an effect on families, but also on the communities. The western part of the Netherlands, even 50 kilometers inland, these communities were all devastated almost. It really made an impact on myself uh, and, and the fact that I'm always keen to know more and try to help inform water management. The fact that we are very much interested in water management is not only in the Netherlands because it's a very low-lying country, it's also because of the threats coming from increasing sea level and living together with the water has always been on my mind. And when science informs policy making, it's always been high on the agenda. So the floods of 53 were one of the main motivations to have several measures in place. So the, what we call the Delta Works, large uh, sea walls and dikes uh, being built. It's all based on this particular event these extreme events from the past determining how high the dikes should be built and how high the construction should be. Now, of course, with climate change, we also see that the conditions are changing. Sea level is rising and we already measure rising sea levels compared to 1953. Sea level has already risen by several centimeters along the coastline and that will only continue going into the future. So that means that we need to revisit all the different constructions that have been built and see if they are still up to the task. Adapting to climate conditions, present day and future, has always been very high on the agenda in the Netherlands. And I think it's starting more now to become more global and also here in the UK. You see alongside uh, mitigating the, the worst impacts of, of climate change, we also need to adapt to climate change. It's not only defending, but it's also giving more space to the water to flow inland if needed. So it's, it's partly building the defences, but also partly giving more space where the water can flow. Professor Albert Kleintank recounting the memories of those affected by the 1953 North Sea storm. Now, since then, the Netherlands and the UK have carried out large studies on strengthening coastal defences. The Netherlands developed the Delta Works and the UK constructed a storm surge barrier on the Thames estuary. 
of course, the, the, there was much more limit to, to the way that we forecasted weather back then as well. There weren't any warnings given. Nowadays, of course, we'd, we'd spot a low pressure like that days ahead and we'd be able to, to give much better advice, uh, as well as those defences being, being much stronger as well. So, Alex, let's just go back to the present and into the weekend. Any sign of any more nacreous clouds in the forecast? Well, nacreous clouds are very difficult to predict, but uh, colder air is certainly on the horizon. It is going to turn a little chillier through the course of this weekend. A lot of dry weather this weekend, thanks to high pressure. However, that will be the dominant feature. There'll be some rain crossing Scotland and Northern Ireland on a, a cold front during Saturday. So a spell of rain here, but it'll fizzle out as it pushes southwards into parts of England and Wales on Saturday night. And behind that cold front, another high builds in. So as I said, a lot of dry weather around particularly Sunday, looks sunny. Looks like a belter of a winter's day, if you like it, cold and crisp, because there will be a touch of frost returning on Saturday night and into Sunday morning. So a chillier start and a cooler day. But temperatures on Sunday compared to Saturday, we're looking at seven or eight Celsius rather than 11 or 12. So there will be a drop, but there will be more sunshine. And of course, seven or eight Celsius in February is still uh, about average for the time of year. So we're going from mild on Saturday to cooler, but back to average for Sunday. Now, there was a hint from some computer models of much colder air coming in from the east. That is now very, very unlikely, about 10, 15 percent chance of something colder coming into the east. And even if that were to happen, the chances of any significant snow are much smaller than that. The main theme for next week is that high pressure will dominate. It'll be colder than this week, but nothing exceptional. And uh, we're not at the moment uh, forecasting any significant snowfall. So we're anticipating a little sunshine this weekend and this weekend, Alex, it's the Green Football Weekend, which brings together premiership clubs, local football teams as they score green goals and raise awareness on sustainability and climate change. Now, this is a massive initiative supported by sports presenters and network TV, as well as us at the Met Office. So, Alex, we did a Twitter space on Thursday about just this. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Really, really interesting subject. I mean, I love football anyway, so I could talk about that generally. But this was this was two of my favourite things coming together. You know, we're talking about climate and football. And we were really lucky to be joined uh, by the Football for Future initiative. We had uh, Barney on from there. And we also had Sarah on from the Green Football Weekend. Now, Green Football Weekend is this initiative uh, that's really been gaining force over the past month or so. This is the big weekend they've been setting up for a year. And it's all about sustainability. Sustainability, all about talking about it, going to football, educating football clubs and how clubs can do more and how fans can do more. There was offers on like cheaper vegan burgers uh, this weekend at some of the Premier League clubs. And we also had Professor Lizzie Kendon on from the Met Office, who was talking about, you know, the consequences and the, the likelihood of more severe rainfall events. And actually, as, as sea levels rise, some some football clubs, ones close to rivers and seas, are, are actually under threat from being underwater by the end of the century. Places like Fulham, for example, on the, on the banks of the Thames, so high profile clubs. They do have to build in resilience for our changing climate. So it's a really great initiative. It'd be really interesting to see how it catches on this weekend. And hopefully it'll be something that can we can build on uh, year on year. Because as we know, one of the best things to combat climate change is talking about it, is communication. So if we can get the football culture, the culture of football talking about it, that's, that's a big area. I can't believe we've been talking about football twice now, last week mm. and this week. You know, your influence is really sort of seeping <laughs> into all aspects of this production, Alex. Well, um, you say that, Claire, but your Twitter spaces, you know, you were, you were getting in there, your, your was, knowledge of yeah. Watford and your, your yeah. the Hornets. So you can go back and listen to Claire's football knowledge uh, and all that on our Twitter spaces. Find the Met Office on Twitter and we posted it, as, as Claire said, on Thursday afternoon. So you can go and listen again to the whole thing. Really interesting. Fantastic. Now, Alex, um, it's a slight issue. We don't have anyone to give us the highs and lows. So I thought we could do it. So where was the warmest place last week? Tuesday. Remember, we had really warm conditions. The touch of the fern effect lifted the temperatures in Aberdeen to 15.8 degrees Celsius. That was the warmest day, Tuesday. 
Yes, and the coldest night was during the early hours of Monday morning, so just 24 hours before that, but further south across Santon Downham in Suffolk, where the temperature actually dipped to minus 9.8 degrees Celsius. And in fact, I think the day after we saw a temperature around minus 8 degrees in Benson in Oxfordshire. So it wasn't an isolated event. It was very cold across this portion of the country. And Heathrow yeah. recorded its lowest temperature for, for many years as well on those mornings. Um Achnagat was the wettest place, 32.6 millimetres of rain. That was last Sunday. That was the wettest spot of the week. And finally, and I love this name. I mean, I bet some really lovely people live in Omensbury. I bet, Omensbury. Some, nut- I bet, I bet some nutters live there. See I don't think you there. can say that. Almonds, almonds, but it's almond. almond oh, OK. Nut. Yes, you can. All right. We'll keep that in. <laughs> and that is in Avon. Almondsbury in Avon and it's always sunny there because they clocked up the highest amount of sunshine last week 8.2 hours of sunshine on Tuesday I'm sure they do get a bit of rain as well but you can imagine there's meadows and buttercups and roses around the door and everything so yes hello to everybody listening from Almondsbury in Avon and that's it for weather snap Alex always great to have your company well done on the Twitter spaces keep up the good work and enjoy a weekend of football is your daughter playing she is playing, yeah. Big away game this weekend. We won last weekend, so yeah, hopefully uh, it'll be on. Should be. And uh, yeah, more football, more football chat next week. Possibly. Okay, that's all from us, Alex and Claire, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.